Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built it up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves every man's conscience in the sight of God. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but of sincerity, being sincere, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ." Brother says Christ, today we're going to talk about to give or not to give. That is the question. I have a sister in Christ that was asking me a question about donations and what to donate to and how to donate and everything. And I said, well, I've talked about this a lot. How about we do a study on it? Okay. And you said, well, why did you read those verses? Because today, traditions of men and the way things are being done is not the Bible way. It's based off of traditions of men. It's based off rudiments of the world. And not after Christ. And we're going to get into this, okay? So, before we get into it, this is going to be a long study, brothers and Christ, so please get your King James Bibles out. I won't be actually turning. You can pause. I'm going to be reading the scriptures from here because we've got a lot to go through. You can pause the video, turn to the scriptures. Now, I could have made this video in just a few minutes. You ready for it? Donations. In the Old Testament, donations were to keep up a physical building, a temple built with man's hands, and it was to keep a Levitical priesthood, a, pre, a Levite that's in the priest office, not all Levites, but the Levite that was in the priest office, it was to take care of them as they performed the priest office. So you had a Levitical priesthood and you had a temple. Okay? That was Old Testament. They're trying to bring us back under the Old Testament. Why? Because the same thing's being done today. You're donating to these battle buildings to keep up a temple built with man's hands and to pay a Levitical priesthood to perform the service. But is that for today? No. Why? Because today, we're going to get into the scriptures, but today, who's the, where's the temple today? That's the question I'd ask. Who's the temple for the Holy Ghost today? We are, brother says Christ. Who is the priesthood of the believer? We are the body of Christ as a whole. The body of Christ as a whole is now the temple. The body of Christ as a whole is now the uh, priesthood of the believer. We're all called into the ministry of reconciliation. We're supposed to be a living witness and as well as a verbal witness. Living for God. All right. That being said, so what are donations supposed to go to in the New Testament? the body of Christ as a whole. Is that what's going on today? No. For the most part, it isn't. Today, they're trying to get you back under the Old Testament where there's a building built with man's hands. It's called a church. It's treated like a temple. And all the money goes to that temple and the men that are in that temple performing the, the work of that temple. That's Old Testament. And we're going to hit this. We're going to kick this 10% tithe, too. Once again, where do they go to get all this stuff? I've listened to people. I'm going to call them out by name. Sam Gipp. I, I, I listen to his so-called preaching on tithing. And where does he go to try to prove 90% of what he says? The Old Testament. Right? And the moment I say chapter and verse in the Pauline epistles, you know what I get accused of being? You're a hyper-dispensationalist. No, I'm not. I go throughout the whole... You see me teach. Do I just use Pauline epistles all the time? Or do we go all over the Bible to teach? We go all over the Bible to teach. But if you're going to claim something's doctrine for today, not instruction righteousness, but doctrine for today, I need to see it in the Pauline epistles. Okay? We're going to go through... Okay, we're going to start... Like I said, I could go through real easy and quick and say, Hey, that's it. That's the way it's supposed to be done. You donate to the brethren as a whole, and that's it. But then you'd be a follower of me, a respecter of persons. Thus saith Philip Newton. 
Okay? That's why we're not going to do that. We're going to go through the scriptures, and we're going to let the scriptures speak for themselves. Okay? So get your King James Bibles out. I'm not the final authority. Okay? The Word of God is. And we're going to show where they're wrong, and we're going to show how we're supposed to be doing things today to help answer some questions for some brothers and sisters in Christ. So the best way to do it is, is I'm going to start, we're going to start in the Old Testament, and we're going to work our way to the New Testament. Okay, we're going to show how things were in the Old Testament, and were they exactly how they say they were? We're going to find that there are some differences than what you've been taught in these Babel buildings. Okay, because they leave verses out, they leave things out, because if you just grab... Someone once said, I think it was Peter Ruckman once said, that if you can make this book say whatever you want to say by just grabbing what you want and throwing everything else out. Absolutely, absolutely. So what they do is they go to the Old Testament, grab what they want, and deceive you into thinking you have to give a ten, that you're required, commanded, to give a 10% tithe. Now, was there a tithe that was commanded in the Old Testament? Yes. Is there a tithe commanded in the New Testament? No. We're going to get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. So please bear with me, brothers and Christ. This is going to be a long road because it could be a short one. I could just show in the New Testament. But I wanted to show you to answer these questions that I'm getting from some of the brethren. Where they're getting a lot of the stuff. They're getting it from the Old Testament, and they're getting it from Catholicism, the Catholic Church. You know what the Catholic Church loves? They love to have money, power, and control. That's what they love. Money, power, and control. What does the Bible say? The love of money is the root of all evil. Why some have cut it after they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We use that verse a lot, but you know what it's really meant for? That verse is primarily meant for men in ministry. We're going to get to that. But we always, for instruction righteousness, we use it for anybody. Because it's great instruction righteousness. Don't fall in the trap of love of money. But doctrinally, it's addressed to pre uh, preachers, men in ministry, living that their whole life, they give their whole life to ministry, that they're not supposed to be in it for the money. And when they get into it and start getting into the money, 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 money. They start erring from the faith and piercing themselves through with many sorrows. But, once again, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, brothers and sisters of Christ, turn to Genesis 14.10. The word tithing. We use the word donation, but the word giving is in the Bible. The word tithing is in the Bible. Okay? Tithing. The first time tithing is mentioned in the Bible. Genesis 14.17. And the kingdom... Oh, sorry. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Teterloimer, and of the kings that were with him, and of the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale. Now, if you don't understand what's going on here, Lot is in Sodom, and these bandits, these other kings, come in, and they raid Sodom, and they take Lot, and they take him away. And this is Abraham, and Abraham goes, Oh, Lot's family. I'm going to go help him. So he grabs some of the servants, they go, they take them out, they get Lot, they get everything that they took from Sodom and Gomorrah, and they bring it back, and this is where we're at right now. Verse 18, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, we're not going to get into that. <laughs> I was reading, we got a commentary here, uh, Peter Ruckman's commentary, I was reading a little bit about Melchizedek, because some people say, well, it's Jesus in the Old Testament, but then someone makes a comment where in Hebrews, I think it is, it says he's like Jesus. So if it's like Jesus, he can't be Jesus if he's like Jesus. But then some people say, well, Jesus, it's saying he's like Jesus in the sense of he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, or in the Old Testament he had an incorruptible body. I believe that 100% as far as that Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came as one of us so he could take on the sins of the world. But in the Old Testament he had an incorruptible body. But we're not going to get into Melchizedek as far as who he is. It's just what happens here. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. He's a king. Now, in type, we're going to get into this. In type, he is a Christ. He's a, he's a type of Jesus. In all the Bible, they say this man's a type of Jesus. That man's a type. Of, he's a type. Okay. It's important. Why? Verse 19. We're going to keep going. And he blessed him and said, "Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth." 20, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. 
God delivered the enemies into Abraham's hand, and God gave him all that stuff. All the loot, all the people back. Not, I say loot, but, you know, the spoils. Now here it is. And he gave him tithes of all. Abraham gave Melchizedek, king of Salem, tithes of all. Everything that, that, he, that he got. He gave him tithes of all. Verse 21, And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. Now this is, he, okay. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from thee, take a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say, I have made Abraham rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eshcol, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. So he gives this tithe to, of all okay, to, Mamre, uh, to the king of uh, Melchizedek, king of Salem. This is the first time tithe is mentioned. Okay. Now one thing I'd like to point out here is, it doesn't say 10% tithe. He gave 10% of all that he owned. That's not what it says here. It says he just he gave a tithe of all. Okay. And when I was looking up Peter Ruckman, I said, well, what does Peter Ruckman say about it? Okay, and he gives a list here as a definition. Okay. He is Abram, gave him Melchizedek tithes of all the booty and spoil. This is the first mention of tithe and should should be noticed carefully. It is given to an individual, it is given to an individual who is a type of Christ. Okay. But we get over here and there's a list of things. And it says, in the Old Testament, under law, the place of tithing was the storehouse. Mal uh, I think that's Malachi 3.10. In the New Testament, under grace, the place was laid in store, 1 Corinthians 16.2. Now, was it laid in store once in 1 Corinthians 16.2? Yes, it was. But is that how it was done all the time? No. He left out Acts where uh, all the money was brought to the apostles and the elders' feet. And the apostles and the elders redistributed the, the donations out to people as they have need. They didn't store it up. It just was stored up once. And if you read the story, I don't know if I have it in my notes, but if you read the story, Paul was coming through and you have a church that had money, the, a church that was in abundance, because we're going to be talking about that. That's the whole point. You donate of your abundance. Okay. And their abundance, you have a church that had abundance, they were setting aside their abundance for a church over here that had lacking, that had need, that was poor. And Paul said, I'm coming through on the first day, make sure everything's stored up and ready to go, so when I come through, there's no gathering, I'm just going to grab it and I'm going to go, I'm going to get to this church over here where I'm going to be preaching, which means he didn't preach on that first day of the week, but I'm going to get over here and I'm going to be preaching this church, I'm already heading that way, I'm going to take the donation you have to that poor church. That was mentioned once, but in the book of Acts, I know it's a transition book, but it shows that there was more to it than that. There's times where you can lay it up when someone's going to come by and pick it up and take it somewhere. But some, a lot of times it's the elders and the deacons that hold the money and they redistribute the money, the donations, to the whole church as they have need. And yes, that would include men in ministry. But it includes the whole church as a whole. Today, they try to separate it and make it just the men in ministry. Uh, no, it's not supposed to be a business. It's not supposed to be a guaranteed um, salary every month. Right. But when they have need, yeah, you do pay. You do give money and food and clothing and, and, and provide a roof over the head of the men that are trying to serve God fully and completely. I'm not saying you don't. But that's included with the whole brethren. You're supposed to be doing that for all the brethren, making sure they have food and clothing and roof over their head to keep uh, dry and warm in the summer, or winter, and to keep cool, like in the shade, to keep cool during the summer. That's something we're supposed to be doing for all the brethren, which we're going to find out in this study. So he doesn't tell all of it. He tells some of it, but not all of it. Verse 3, in the Old Testament, animals and vegetation, vegetables, were tithed. We're going to show that's not true. That I mean, it's true, but it's not the whole truth. There was more to tithing than just animals and vegetation. Okay. Predominantly, when we get into the Levi Levites, predominantly, it was, um, we're going to find out that they donated materials when it came to keeping the house of the Lord up and running. 
when the, when the house of the Lord came in. Now remember, this is Abraham. This is before the tabernacle was, was built. You know, the tent, the tents and everything. And it was before the first temple was built. But I'm going through the whole Testament as tithing. Tithing was used for what Peter Ruckman says here, animal and vegetation was used. Uh, gold was used. Materials were used in tithing. Okay? But he just says it's animal and vegetation. And he shows Le Leviticus 27.30 and Matthew 23.23. 23. But we're going to show in the what, what gets left out a lot. He mentioned Matthew 20.23, 20, but in the Gospels, which we're going to mention, uh, they were given money as donation, as tithing. They were tithing gold. Hmm. So gold was tithed in the Old Testament, but it's not mentioned here in Peter Ruckman's commentary. Verse 4, in the New Testament it appears to be money. Okay? And for the most part, yeah, in the New Testament it was. They were selling everything, taking the money, put, giving it to the elders and the apostles, who are elders, and they were redistributing out to the, the saints as they hath need. Okay? That's how donations are supposed to work, but I'm getting ahead of myself. In the Old Testament, the tithe supported the Levites and priests. Yes, that's true, but you know what he leaves out here? It also supported a physical temple built with man's hands. He left that part out. But Nehemiah 10, 37-38, and Numbers 18, 24, where he uses, and it, he's right here, but he leaves stuff out. Okay? Tithing was also used to keep up a, a temple built with man's hands. In the New Testament, it supports ministers and poor saints. Okay? That's true. But like I said, as a whole, it's, it's taking care of all saints. And here's the thing. Ministers that give their life to the Lord fully and completely, the, it's a life calling. It's not a business. It's not a 9-to-5 job. It's not a salary. When they give their life to Jesus Christ, they are going to be poor. And they are saints. Okay, Paul warns. We read that verse. I said the love, uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. While some cut it after they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Paul warns that men get in the ministry. You don't get into ministry for the money. You're not going to be living a regular life like another brother in Christ. You know, this other brother in Christ has a secular full-time job. He's got an income that comes in steadily every month. He's got a home. He's got a wife. He's got children. He, you're not going to be living in a life exactly like them. But today, they try to live a life like everyone else, men in ministry. I, I can have my own home. I can live my dream life and with my dream wife and dream children and, and you know, my toys. And, and I just go to this Babel building and put on a nice suit and tie and my priestly robe, nice suit and tie and everything. And yeah, right. So even though he singles out ministers because Paul talks about how people helped him when he was in need. He was a saint in need. He was a, Bible, uh, a brother in Christ that needed food and raiment as he's doing the work of the Lord. Absolutely. I'm not against helping brethren out that are serving the Lord fully and completely. So please understand that. I'm not. But you're supposed to do that for everyone in the body of Christ. Not just men in ministry. And in these last days, where do donations mostly go to? Just Babel buildings, temples built with man's hands, and men in ministry. It's not going to the brethren as a whole. And I've got testimonies on that. But I want to get ahead of myself. 7. In the Old Testament, it is brought once every three years. Deuteronomy 26, 12. That is true. That is true. But what's left out here is there are certain situations when you read the Old Testament where they took collections for a specific reason that broke this three year. Okay? We're going to read some of that. Verse 8. Or, verse 8. <laughs> 8. And the New Testament is brought on the first day of the week. It was brought on the first day of the week once. Because Paul was coming through on the first day of the week. Okay? It's not always collected on the first day of the week. Once again, the reason Peter Ruckman says that is he's in the Babel building system. And like I said before, I love Peter Ruckman. He's got a great testimonies. The man knows the Bible. But the man, like I said, I'm not the final authority. And Peter Ruckman's not the final authority. Okay? He, he was spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world. So when he's trying to push the Babel building system and how they're doing things, he's going to take things in the Bible and try to make it sound like it's for what he's doing. Yes, they brought on the first day of the week once. 
once. Now, where does it say it was the first day of the week in the book of Acts when they're, people are selling and donating and they're taking the money and redistributing it out to the, the poor, the saints? Where is it saying it's only done on the first day of the week? It isn't. It was only stored up once and had to be ready to go because Paul was coming through on the first day of the week. He didn't stop and preach or nothing. He grabbed the donation and went over to the, the, the church that needed the money. And that's where he was preaching and teaching that day. And he didn't even do it on the first he came through on the first. By the time he got to that church, like five, six, maybe two weeks later, traveling, remember you had to walk on feet. Whenever he got to that next church that needed the money, he gave him the money and he preached the word of God. Whatever day it was. But this whole thing about the first day of the week, the first day of the week. You can come together any day of the week, brothers and Christ. You can give to the Lord with, with having love for the brothers and sisters Christ and give to the Lord any day of the week and support brethren and help them out any day of the week. It's not the first day of the week. All right? But like I said, he mentions 1 Corinthians 16, 1, 2. Is that true? That on that time, did they store it up? First day of the week, yeah. But not every day of the week. It's not always has to be done on the first day of the week. And Peter Ruckman doesn't say it does either. He just grabs one reference where it was that gives us an actual date. First day of the week is when Paul came through. So I'm not trying to kick him too much, but I'm just saying... With this list here, he leaves stuff out. We're going to go through some of the stuff he leaves out, and then we're going to go through some of the stuff he did put in. Okay, verse 10. In the New Testament, it is according as a man purposed in his heart, both cheerfully and bountifully. See, Peter Ruckman had it right. But a lot of the Bible buildings, like Sam Gitt, pushing a 10% tithe. You're supposed to give 10% of your paycheck before you do anything with it. That's Catholic. That's Catholicism. That's the love of money. Okay, that's not how it's supposed to be. We're going to prove that it's the abundance. After you paid your bills, your debt, you pay, uh, you're, you're providing food and raiment for you and your family. A man provide not for his own. He's worse than an infidel. Once you've provided the basic needs and you paid your bills, whatever you have left over, that's called an abundance. Whatever you have left over, that's where the tithe comes from. And we're going to, I'm going to prove that. Okay? And Peter Ruckman's here, bountifully, cheerfully and bountifully. You're bountifully what, what you have left over. Okay. But a lot of these battle buildings push, no, you're supposed to give a 10% tithe first. And if you can't feed your children and clothe your children and put a roof over their head, then that's your problem and that's your fault and you need to do something about it. But we deserve our this battle building, this business, this temple built with man's hands, we deserve 10% first. And we're going to prove that's not in Scripture. Not in Scripture at all. Who does that? Catholicism does that. The Catholic Church does that. Brother and sister Christ, I watched a lot of videos in the past, the Reformation and everything, and you look, they're all about money. Donate, donate, donate. Money, money. Keeping buildings up. Traditions of men. They had, um, they brought in the deception. They brought in fake uh, items and said, like, this is a nail from, from the cross that Jesus was crucified. Here's a piece of wood from the cross that Jesus was crucified. And this is the cup that we found. We found the cup that, you know, Jesus used when he broke bread with the, the, the apostles and stuff like this. Oh, here's a scrap of rags from Peter's robe. Yeah. They did those things. Why are we so, why the battle building system as a whole lining more up with Catholicism than it does with the Word of God. Okay. In the New Testament, in the Old Testament, the tithe plus an offering. In the Old Testament, which he leaves out here, it was a command in the Old Testament. Ah! Now you wonder why they like to go to the Old Testament to try to prove the 10% tithe. Because in the Old Testament, it wasn't a 10% tithe, but it was a tithe, and it was commanded. It was. I'm not going to hide. It was commanded. We're going to show the scriptures. But is it commanded today? No. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 9. No, it's not commanded today. When you make it a command, you go against the scriptures. But once again, where, what's 2 Corinthians 6, 9, 6 through 9? It's in the Pauline epistles. For today. Where do they go to? The Old Testament. But if you open your mouth and say chapter and verse on the Pauline epistles... They'll call you a hyper-dispensationalist. If you say, but, but in the Pauline epistles, it says something different than the Old Testament. 
they'll still get on to you and say, you're a hyper dispensationalist. Uh, no, you guys don't like how things are supposed to be done today. You want to do things your way, Catholicism's way. So you want to go back into the Old Testament. And you want to do things the Old Testament way because it's more profitable. You can have more money, more power, more control that way. Getting ahead of myself, okay? But just wanted to read that. So Peter Ruckman, it's a good read. I just believe that if you, you start with this, and if you keep studying the issue, giving, tithing, and whatnot, you're going to find out there's things he left out. Okay? There's things he left out. And you realize, like I said, first day of the week. Uh, no, that whole first day of the week thing, you can meet any day of the week. Okay? The, ch the, the church met one time to preach and teach on the first day of the week. Paul met one time to pick up some donations and keep going. He didn't stop to preach or teach, but he collected everything on the first day of the week once. And because of those two incidences, now we always have to meet on the first day of the week. You always take donations on the first day. What happens? Traditions of men come in. And traditions of men start usurping the commandments of God, and the traditions of men become the authority, and throw this, and put, this gets pushed to the side. Well, this is all, we've always have done it. This is how we always have done it. This is how the church fathers have done it. Where they get from the Reformation. Where they get from Catholicism. They never hate it when I take it all the way back. A lot of the traditions of men in the battle building system, the way they're doing the battle building system, has no basis in Scripture, brother says Christ. No basis in Scripture. Where they get it from church fathers. Where they get it from the Reformation. Where they get it from Catholicism. Where did Catholicism get it from? Paganism and Catholicism tried to replace Israel. In the Old Testament, you'll find some things that they're done, they're doing that in the Old Testament. But are we supposed to be doing that today? No. So that's the, yeah. please, Brother Jesus Christ, hopefully you're still with me and you haven't just, you know, oh, I'm not going to listen to this guy because he's against tithing. I'm not against tithing. I'm 100% for tithing when it's done the Bible way. I'm 100% against traditions of men that go against the commandments of God. Philosophy that go against the commandments of God. Rudiments of the world that go against the commandments of God. I'm for the Lord. Brother says, Christ, are you for the Lord? I hope so. I hope so. We can make mistakes. We can be for the Lord and be gung-ho. Remember Peter? He was gung-ho. Whack the ear off the, of the uh, priest. I don't know if you watched that story, that the study we did when I had the sword out, and we were talking about Peter, courageous man, foolish man, lopping off an ear. Peter was so gung ho, he wanted to fight for the Lord and fight for the Lord, but he didn't know how to fight for the Lord. He didn't know when to fight for the Lord. Okay, there's times that we fight for the Lord, there's times we step back and let people fall on their face until they're ready for us to step forward and say, okay, this is what the Bible actually says. Okay. There's a time to fight, and there's a way we're supposed to fight for the Lord. Peter is just so, like I said, you can get all, I'm going to defend my Bible building, and you get that sword out like Peter did, and you whack that ear off, but you're not listening to Jesus Christ. Peter had a problem there for a while, he wouldn't listen to Jesus Christ. I'm going to die and be rose again the third day, and Jesus rebuked Jesus. He, would, he didn't want to hear what Jesus had to say, he rebuked him. Jesus told him before he was ascended up, he told Peter and all of them, hopefully I've been saying Peter instead of Paul, sometimes P and P, and I, can mix, I, I say them wrong, forgive me. But Peter, he told Peter and the people who were there that they were to wait until Pentecost to do anything. And what did they do? Peter didn't wait. He got excited. i got to do something for the Lord, and you know what? We need a twelfth apostle. But it wasn't an apostle that God called as an apostle. God didn't choose that man. Peter and the people did. They didn't wait. They get, sometimes you get excited for the Lord and you want to do something for the Lord, but we need to learn patience and we need to learn to listen to what God actually has to say, not what men have to say. You say, why are you taking that? Because a lot of people are going to defend their, 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 their respecter of persons, whether it's on YouTube that claims to be full-time ministry and taking donations, and the people in the Bible building system, you're going to have people that just vehemently try to defend, 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 and they don't listen. They'll listen to that guy, but they don't listen. Okay, so let's let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay, tithe. When you look up tithe, 
in the uh, uh, Webster's 1820 Dictionary, it says the tenth part of the increase, increase, not the basics, the pay, the take care of everything, the food, the clothing, the bills, the increase. It's a tenth part of the increase annually arising from the profits of land and stock allotted to the clergy for their support. All right? And like I said, I'm going to prove that it's not just for the clergy, but it was also for a building, to keep a building up. It's for both. And it's not for the Levites as a whole. It was the Levites. It was like two or three months. I, please don't quote me on that, but you can look it up. They were in the priest's office for so many months, and then so many months they were in their own land, working their own land. Now, the land wasn't theirs, because remember, God's their inheritance, but they were given land to live off of, okay, by all the other 11 tribes. Right? So they, had, they went home and did work with their hands, you know, what you call secular work, where they had animals and crops and vineyards and stuff like that. And then so many months out of the year, the Levites would go to Jerusalem and do the work of the, the priest's office at the temple. Okay. Now, I uh, don't have to turn here, but I'm going to go through these real quick. But Proverbs 3.9, Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the firstfruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. The first fruits that I'd increased. So that's where you get part of it. Okay, it was a yearly tithe. Uh, Peter Ruckman said it was uh, every three years, because he had it, once every three years. And he, he had Deuteronomy. He had the verses to back it up. All right. But you see that it was brought. All right. I'm all for storing up for a year, brother says Christ. You save up food for a year, and then anything you have excess at that point, that's what you would donate. Now, I don't want to get too far. I'm, I'm trying not to stray too much because this is a long study, and we're still on the first page of seven. Forgive me, brother says Christ. Hopefully you take time. We might break this up into multiple parts. But you guys remember Ruth. When you have the gleanings, you have the harvest, you, you have a time to plant, you have the harvest... And then you have the gleanings, whatever is little bits left over at the end. Those were told to be left there for the poor. So the poor could come through and glean and get some food. Okay. So we're supposed to help. That's for the poor. But this, we're, we're talking about tithing. We're giving it to the Lord. Okay. This is talking about the poor, period. We're allowed to come in. Okay. Remember Ruth. He was, she was a Moabitess. Now, I believe since she married the Jewish, a Jewish man, she got adopted into the Jews. She's considered a Jew. But she's a, by birth, she's a, a Moabitess, I think is what it was. But she's a Gentile. Okay. But she was out there gleaning. The poor are allowed to glean. Okay. Today, donations, first and foremost, are supposed to go to help the poor in the body of Christ. Then, if God puts it on your heart, witness to somebody and buy them some food. Witness to somebody and buy them some clothes. Witness to people, like I do, and buy them some gas. Sometimes you see them with signs saying, I need gas, I need gas. Okay. By all means, the lost world. But donations, when it comes within the body of Christ, that go before the elders, it's supposed to go back out to the body of Christ as the brethren hath need. Okay. 2 Chronicles 31.5 And as soon as the, as the commandment came abroad, the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of corn, wine, and oil, and honey, and of all the increase of the field, and the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. So you get this, and it talks about, oh, it's talking about corn, wine, oil, honey, and of the increase of the field. Then it says, and the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. And the tithe. So it separates. There's another tithe separate from those. I believe it's gold and silver. Okay. And we're gonna, I'm going to show this in some other things. But you see there in abundance, they're bringing in a tithe. Luke 18.11, Luke 18.11, this is important. Okay, We're not going to get into it. I always want to get into the study because we've done studies before. The Pharisee and the publican, the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee stood praying thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Now here's, we're, I, I want to keep going, but we're going to stop after this, verse 12. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. 
There's two things to remember here. This is Old Testament. So what are those tithes going to? They're going to a physical temple to keep a physical temple up and to support the Levitical priesthood as they're performing the duties and all the materials that's required to perform the duties in that said temple. Okay? That's the first thing to remember. Second thing to remember here, it says, of all that I possess. Wouldn't that include gold and silver? Wouldn't that include materials? Oh, uh, they need they, they need uh, new uh, priest robes. The robes are falling apart. They need new material for the robes. They can either buy it with money that's been donated to the temple, or you can donate some material for them to make robes, new robes. Okay? He says, all that I possess. Okay? But it's the heart. We're going to talk about it. It's the heart issue. Giving is not... You're not going to get rewards for giving, the actual act of giving. Okay? God looks at the heart. This man here, not getting in too much, but his heart was in the wrong place. The publican's heart was in the right place. The poor publican and this rich Pharisee. All right? Now, publicans weren't always poor either, but you know what I'm saying. He came in poor in spirit. It was the heart. But the point I'm making here for this subject is tithes of all that I possess. So it wasn't just food and animals, like vegetation and animals. It was anything and everything that God required to keep that temple up and running and the Levitical priesthood up and running, performing the works of the Lord in said temple. Okay. Mark 12, 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money in the treasury. You guys remember this story? Cast money in the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. Many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which hath cast in through the treasury. Why? Verse 44. For all they did cast in of their abundance. But she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Now the whole point of this is, where do we get a tenth part? I'll show you where they get it from, but it's not in here. But this story right here, Brother Jesus Christ, we're supposed to give, now it's not a command, but it's a heartfelt thing, that when God gives you abundance, you should have a desire to share it. When you've got more than you need, it should be a natural, heartfelt desire to want to share it with poor neighbors, with poor that you come across in the city, uh, with brothers and sisters in Christ that are in need. You should want to share it when you have an abundance. Okay? But there are times where there's some people that go a step farther, like this woman did. Evidently, that day there was a call. I'm not trying to add to the scriptures, but there might have been a call where they need donations because we need to repair this door. We need donations because we need new robes for the priesthood. We need new uh, this. We need that. We need things to do the work of the Lord because remember they're in uh, captivity at this time and they're in a, the poor. everything was probably in a poor state. The temple was probably in a poor state, whatever. And she's like, this is all I've got. I'm going to give it to them. Now I still believe it's abundance. She, she was able to eat, she, she was able to, she's got clothes, she's got food, God has taken care of her. This is two of her abundance, but she gave in all of her abundance. Now remember, there is no 10% tithe here. She gave in all of her abundance. That two coins is all she had left over. She could have thrown in one coin and kept one for herself. God blessed her with it. That's okay. That's not wrong. But she threw in all of her abundance, I believe. All of it. That's all she had left gone. These other men were throwing in their abundance. Let's say they had 100 coins. They threw in 50 coins. But they still kept 50 coins. They threw in, you know, they had 1,000 coins. They threw in 800 coins. But they still kept 200 coins. And as you think, 800 coins, that's a lot. But that's of their abundance. And they still kept, I believe they kept some back for themselves. Because we're looking at how donations are speed. It's supposed to be the abundance that you donate and tithe. Okay. This woman, that two mites, is that what it said? Uh, two mites which make a farthing, that's all she had. That's all that's left over. That's all, I believe that's all her abundance was. And she threw it in. She threw it all in. It wasn't 10% tithe. That was 100% tithe. 
Okay. It's about the, we're going to learn in this study, that it's about the abundance. That do you give to the Lord the abundance? When He blesses you greatly, do you give some back? Absolutely. But how are we supposed to give? Why are we supposed to give? That'll be at the end of this study. Okay. But where do we get the ten part of the tithe? Because today it's this push in these Babel buildings, these so-called fundamental Baptist Babel buildings and all others. Ten percent tithe. Ten, where do they get that from? Turn to Genesis 28, 20. Chapter 28, verse 20. This is where they get it from. And Jacob vowed a vow. Jacob vowed a vow. People say, well, Jacob is Israel. Uh, you're getting ahead of yourself right now. Jacob is not Israel. Not yet. It's just Jacob. Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in his way that I go, and will give me bread to eat, and raiment to put on. Now first, now sorry, that first you say, well, isn't that like us today? Oh, absolutely, instruction righteousness. We, I don't make a vow. I don't tell God, if you do this, I'll do this. That's not how we're supposed to be today. They did that a lot in the Old Testament. If you do this, I'll do this. No, today, Lord, I'm yours. I'm your servant. I'll serve you no matter what. But I trust you, Lord that you'll keep me in the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on. I trust you, Lord. I pray for these things that you provide and I trust you, Lord. And there's no, if you do this, I'll do this. That's not how we're supposed to be today, brothers and sisters Christ. We're bought with a price. We're not our own. We belong to the Lord. We do what He commands us to do. We do what He tells us to do no matter what. But this is Jacob saying, if you do this, then I'll do this. Verse 21, So that I come again to my father's house in peace. He left his father's house, and it's a type of going into the world for 20 years. And he went into the world for 20 years. Seven for one wife, seven for the other. He was supposed to do six. He did seven, was supposed to be doing seven, working for Laban. And he ended up doing six. That makes 20 years. And God brought him back into his father's house in peace. Enoch wanted to kill him when he left. When he came back, they were at peace. Okay. If God does this, then shall the Lord be my God. Or is that how we're supposed to be today, brothers and sisters Christ? Because they have to come to here for the 10% tithe. But is that how we're supposed to be? Then shall the Lord be my God? No. When I got saved, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. That old man is dead and buried at the cross. Jesus raised me up as a new man. He's my God no matter what happens to me down here. God is my God. Jesus is God the Father manifest in the flesh. He is God. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. He's my Master. He's my King. No matter what. But they like to grab from this for some reason. Why? Money, 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 money. Power, control, and wealth. Money. Riches. Then shall the Lord be my God. Verse 22. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. Okay. And, all, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give thee tenth, the tenth unto thee. This is where they get the tenth. A tenth unto thee. And like I said, I point this out. This is Genesis 28, 20. Genesis 32, 28. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. He doesn't become Israel until Genesis 32, 28. Four chapters, if I'm doing this right, four chapters later. So when he makes this promise, it's between Jacob and God. And he promised to give a tenth. Did his children get a tenth, give a tenth? No. When they were in Egypt for 400 years, did they give a tenth? No. This was just between him and God. Okay. Now Moses, when he comes out, that's when we're going to read some of the things where you start getting these laws where it commands them to tithe. In, in their abundance, they're supposed to give a tithe to support a physical temple, because they build the temple, and they're supposed to be supporting a physical temple. And the first temple, remember, it's the uh, it's the tents, the tabernacle, okay. And 
and a Levitical priesthood. They make clothes for Aaron in the priesthood, as he's in, and his sons that are in the office of the, that start the office of the priesthood. Right? But then there's a command that's not a tenth. Where do they get the tenth? They get it from here. Genesis 32. Okay, we did that. Okay. I believe, according to the scriptures, that tithing was done for the priesthood and the temple. And we're going to go through the scriptures to prove that. And that there was no specific amount required. It's just you had. To, it was just it, what was required was the abundance. In your abundance, you're to tithe. You're to give some back to God. He gave you a lot. You give some back to the Lord. In the Old Testament, it was done through the temple and the Levitical priesthood. Right? Just mainly focusing on abundance. When God blesses you above that ye have need. And for today, brothers and sisters, Christ, especially here in America, we've been blessed above that we need. There's no reason we're not helping one another out. I'm getting ahead of myself again, but brothers and Christ, there's no reason we're not helping one another out. You know why we're not helping one another out? Because it's every man for himself and every group for himself, every club for himself, every Babel building for himself, and you've been deceived that you don't help the brethren out, you just throw your money at these Babel buildings and you expect, well, they'll take care of it. They'll help the brethren out. And they're not. They're not helping the brethren out for the most part. They're not. They're taking the money and spending it on a dead building and a Levitical priesthood. That's where most of the money goes, that you donate to these battle buildings. It's not helping the brethren. Right? And they'll try to say, doesn't these church buildings, coming to the church on Sunday help you out? And you can do it without a church building. There's no such thing as a church building. They call it a church building. You can do it without a temple built with man's hands. You can do it in people's homes. You can do it at the park. You can do it by the beach, by the way, in the forest. You know, they used to do it in the forest because they had to hide because Christians were being killed in the past being hunted down by the Catholic Church. So they had to meet secretly in homes and in forests and, and places that hide. But you can meet anywhere. And there's not supposed to be a Levitical priesthood. I want to prove that. We're all part of the priesthood of the believer. There's some men that God, there's offices in the Bible where God will call a man to step up and do more than the average brother or sister in Christ and to be in an office. Absolutely. But there's not a Levitical priesthood like there was in the Old Testament, with a temple made with man's hands that they're keeping up. But let's get into this. Tithing in the Old Testament, the tabernacle, the temple. Let's talk about the temple, because that's what Peter Ruckman left out. He said it was just for the priesthood. Uh, it's for the priesthood and the temple. All right. Exodus 35, 21. Exodus 35, 21. And they came, every one whose heart stirred him up. It's always a heart issue. I always bring this up, brother. It's always a heart issue. It's not a command. It's a heart issue. Here, like I said, they were commanded to don't uh, to tithe when it came to keeping the Levitical priesthood up and running. But there was tithing that people gave out of the, out of their heart, and this is one of those times. Stirred them up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all his service and for the holy garments, and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willingly hearted, and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, all jewels of gold. And every man that had offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and red skins of ram and badger skins brought them. Everyone did that Everyone that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering, and every man with whom was found shittim wood, for any work of, work of service brought it, and you keep reading and everything, but they're bringing these donations. And it's not animals and, clo uh, animals and vegetation, it's actual clothing, material to make clothes, wood to build things, brass and gold and silver. Okay. Why? Because they had to build a tabernacle. Later on, they build a temple. Then, later on, the temple needs to be repaired. Then, the temple needs to be rebuilt because it was destroyed, and so on and so forth. Uh, 2 Kings 12.7, it needed to be repaired. Turn to 2 Kings 12.7. Then, King Jehashur called for Je Je Jehoiada, I hope I pronounced that right, the priest, 
And the other priests had said unto them, Why repair ye not the breaches of the house? There's gold, in, and you know they, they've got gold coming in as donations. Why aren't you uh, repairing the breaches of the house? Now therefore receive no more money of your acquaintance, but deliver it for the breaches of the house. And the priests consent to receive no more money of the people, neither to repair the breaches of the house. But Jedediah the priest took a chest and bore a hole in it, a hole in the lid of it, and set it beside the altar on the right side as one cometh into the house of the Lord. And the priest that kept the door put therein all the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. Tithing. And it was so, when they saw that there was much money in the chest, that the king... that the king's scribes and the high priest came up and they put up in bags and told the money that was found in the house of the Lord and they gave the money being told in the hands of them that did the work that they had the oversight of the house of the Lord and they laid it out in the carpenters and the builders and the wrought upon the house of the Lord and the masons and they did the work and everything and they, they, they repaired the house. Okay, So in the Old Testament there was donations that were brought in Okay, they weren't supposed to go purposely out there saying, give us money. They just put a thing up there, purposed in their heart. People, that when they took money in, they put it in that box. And they repaired it. And those are just two times. But like I said, if you remember, you have the tabernacle was built. People gave tithes, gave offerings. And people, uh, when, they, when Solomon built the temple, he was rich. He built the temple for the house of David. So it came from the house of David the first time it was built, but then it got into disarray and it needed to be kept up. It was burned. The temple was rebuilt. Um, it was repaired once, but it was re it was built once. It was rebuilt a second time, and we're waiting for the they're waiting for the third temple to be rebuilt. Okay. So anyway, so they had a physical temple that needed to be kept up. What about the priest's office? Exodus 28, 1. Exodus 28, 1. And take thou unto thee Aaron by thy brother, and his sons with him, from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, Eleazar and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. Okay. Now we're, this is where we're starting the priesthood gets started. Second okay. Chronicles eleven fourteen. Second Chronicles eleven fourteen. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possessions and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. The reason I threw that down is I'm pointing out that uh, Judah and Benjamin stayed together when they were separated. The kingdom was separated. Okay, so you had. Actually, it's supposed to, it was supposed to be ten and two. Ten tribes over here, and Judah had uh, Benjamin and Judah. But what happened was is it ended up being nine tribes, and the Levites went over there. And there's actually three tribes here. But you have the Levites that are supposed to perform the, the priest office. And if you read that whole story, uh, Jeroboam, he cast off the, the Levites and then made priest of the other tribes. That was against God. Okay, there's only supposed to be a specific group doing the priesthood, and it's the Levites that are supposed to be doing the priesthood. Okay. Numbers 18.24, Numbers 18.24, But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as a heave offering unto the Lord, that's where we learn about heave offerings. It's a heave offering. When you give a tithe, it's a heave offering. I have given to the Levites to inherit. It goes to the Levites. Remember, the Levites, to inherit. Their inheritance is the Lord. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. But their inheritance is the Lord. So when they came in and gave a tithe to the Lord, a heave offering, it went to the Levites. Therefore have I said unto them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. God is their inheritance. But out of that heave offering, because some people will still say, oh, there's going to be another tenth. Turn to Numbers, well, 1826. Jump down two verses. Thus speak unto the Levites, and say unto them, When ye take of the children of Israel the tithes, which I have given you from them for, their, for your inheritance. In other words, they give to the Lord, and the Lord's given to the Levites. That's important. 
when we give, we're not, I'm not giving to the brethren. I'm giving to the Lord, and the Lord's providing for the brethren. You don't give me the glory, you give God the glory. You thank God for what He's given you. I mean, you can thank me for, uh, in general for just being a giver and being, great, uh, being gracious, you know, being humble and great and loving the brethren and, and, and having a cheerful and wanting to give. You can, you can encourage that. But you don't give me thanks for what I gave you. You give God the thanks. It's very important, brothers and Christ. It's very important. You give God the glory. Today, a lot of men in these ministries, you know, online and Babylon, they tend to take a lot of credit for themselves. Which I have given you from them for your inheritance. Then ye shall offer up a heave offering of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. See, look, they had to do a tenth. Uh, the tenth part of the tithe. You say, what is that talking about? If the tithe, if people tithe, let's say ten goats, they would take a tenth of that, which would be one goat, and they would offer it as a burnt offering as a heave offering to the Lord, and the nine goats the Levites took. If it was a hundred cows, they would sacrifice ten of them, a tenth of the tithe. They would sacrifice ten of the cows to the Lord as a burnt offering, a heave offering to the Lord, and the ninety cows they would keep for the Levites to perform the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. Right? It's very important to understand that. But there's a tithe, and that tithe goes to the Lord first, and then it comes from the and once it hits the Lord, it goes back to the Levites. And it's given to them from the Lord. Deuteronomy 12, 6. And thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and heave offerings. Now remember, heave offerings is taken from the tithe, and it becomes a separate offering, a heave offering. Of your hands and your vows, and your freewill offering, and your firstlings of your herds, and of your flock. Okay. But there we see tithes and heave offering. You shall bring it. It's a command. Okay. The, le the heave offering and tithes are for the Levites to inherit. Why is this important? It's important when we get to today. Okay. Why am I going over this? Why am I making a big deal about it? It's a building that they're trying to keep up. And it's a Levitical priest office that they're trying to keep up. And it's their inheritance. Right? Numbers 18.20. Numbers 18.20. Remember, you can always pause the video. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in their land, neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am thy part and thine inheritance among the children of Israel. God is their inheritance. Deuteronomy 18.2 says, Therefore shall they have no inheritance among their brethren. The Lord is their inheritance, as he has said unto them. Today, brothers, says Christ, do we have land as an inheritance? Or is the Lord our inheritance? Do we have a temple that we're supposed to keep up and keep it holy and, live for the, and we're supposed to use it living for the Lord? Getting ahead of myself. So we have a Levitical priesthood to keep up the physical temple and to perform the office of the priest, and the Lord is their inheritance. That's the Old Testament way. And they love to grab the Old Testament way. What about the New Testament? The New Testament, brothers and Christ, turn to 1 Corinthians 6.15, the New Testament. Where is that physical temple in the New Testament? Remember, where's, what's the New Testament? The New Testament comes in at the death of the testator. And Hebrews talks about how, new to, how testaments work. A new instruction righteousness. The New Testament comes in with the death of the testator. So when Jesus died on the cross, that's when the New Testament came in. So anything before Jesus' death, it's under the Old Testament. Now Jesus prophesied and he told the apostles about the time of the Gentiles. That's where we get the title, the time of the Gentiles. For this time period and things that would go on in this time period. How salvation would go out into the world. He did prophesy. But the New Testament doesn't come in until after the death of Jesus Christ. So how are things supposed to be done today? What's that temple today? Is it still a physical temple built with man's hands and we call it a church? 
No, it isn't. 1 Corinthians 6.15 Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. He's getting into idolatry. When you start worshiping false gods as a professing Christian, you start getting into idolatry, you start performing fornication, spiritual fornication. When you start getting into doing the doctrines of devils, you get into spiritual fornication. You're not, so you're not following God anymore, you're following Satan. Okay? But let's keep going. 17. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Whether it's physical fornication. He, and he's talking mainly physical fornication. But then he talks about spiritual fornication. He likens it to spiritually. What you're doing spiritually. It's damaging you spiritually and physically. Right. Flee fornication, every sin that a man doeth without the body, but he that commit fornication sin against his own body. Here we go, verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? How we treat this body is important. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. I'm saved now, and it's all under the blood, and it doesn't matter. Yes, it does still. Your body is now a temple for the Holy Ghost and to be without blemish. Okay, temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We're supposed to keep our body and our spirit holy. Blameless. Our soul is now redeemed and our soul is connected to Jesus Christ. Our soul is not connected to our body. But we're still supposed to bring our body into subjection. And we're supposed to live for the Lord. But your body is the temple for the Holy Ghost. The body of a saved sinner is now the temple. A lot of these Bible buildings don't like that. They'll say it, but they don't like it. Why? Because their actions say they don't like it. They want you to treat that building as if it's the temple, and they want you paying to keep that temple, that physical building up and running. That's not how it's supposed to be today. Romans 12.1, turn to Romans 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. So your body is not only the temple for the Holy Ghost, what goes on in the temple? S sacrifices. You're supposed to have spiritual sacrifices, brothers says Christ. You're supposed to be a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, the changed life. You start sacrificing sin, getting sin out of your life. Okay? You sacrifice your time. Are you starting your day with the Word of God? Ending your day with the Word of God? Studying the Word of God? Hiding God's Word in your heart and living it? You sacrifice your time. Okay? You sacrifice your abundance. We're going to get into that. Okay? A living sacrifice. And be not conformed to this world. How do you know someone's not being a living sacrifice? When they look like the world and they line up with the world. Hence the subject of donations. Why are these battle buildings looking like the world, especially Catholicism, and lining up with the world? Because they're not acting like a living sacrifice. The opposite of a living sacrifice is a holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. How do you know someone's not presenting their bodies as a living sacrifice? They're conforming to the world. How do you see that someone's doing a, a, being, presenting their bodies as a living sacrifice? They're separate from the world. They don't look like the world, talk like the world, act like the world. They're not doing things the world's way, the flesh's way, Satan's way. They're doing things God's way. They're speaking how God has taught them how to speak. They're living how God has taught them how to live. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But this is Christ. Our bodies, when someone gets saved, they're the temple, and that's where the sacrifices go on. Remember the heave offerings. 
That's where the sacrifices go on. This is the temple. I'm a saved, Bible-believing, God-fearing man, a Christian man according to the Scriptures, the King James Bible. I'm in Christ Jesus. I've been made under God wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and I'm sealed into the day of redemption, redemption. I'm the temple. You are the temple. Okay? What about the priesthood? Okay, we've got the temple. What about the priesthood? In the New Testament, 1 Peter 2.5. 1 Peter 2.5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up as a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Once again, we get it re showing how the, the, the person who gets saved, you're the temple. You're that spiritual house. What goes on in that spiritual house? Uh, uh, spiritual sacrifices. And here we get a little bit more information. You're a holy priesthood. Acts 26, 18. You say, well, that's Peter. I understand that's Peter. I understand. But in Acts 26, 18, does it talk about Jesus being our inheritance? We're servants of Jesus. He's our inheritance. We're to serve him. It talks about if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. We come back and rule and reign with Jesus Christ. It says we're going to be priests and kings. Yeah. Right. I think when we got adopted in, we're adopted in as the, as, the, as the Levites. We're adopted into that tribe. And now we're performing the office of the Levite. Our body is the temple for the Holy Ghost. And we are the priesthood of the believer. We're all called in the ministry of reconciliation. We're all supposed to be a verbal witness and a living witness for Jesus Christ. Jesus is supposed to shine through us. Like he did through the temple in the Old Testament and like he did through Moses. Remember that? They had to put a veil over his face because he had been with God. God's light shone through him. That's how it's supposed to be for us today. We're supposed to be a light to this dark world. Okay. Acts 26.18 to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by the faith that is in me, Jesus Christ. He's our inheritance. Ephesians 1.10, turn to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. I always got to say this, the predestination is not saying you're guaranteed to get saved versus guaranteed to get lost, go to hell. It's talking about how we get saved is predestinated. God already had it planned out from the very beginning how we would get saved today. All right. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ and whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, the inheritance, eternal life. What's the, our inheritance? Eternal life. Where do we get that eternal life? Through Christ Jesus our Lord. He's our, inheritance, our inheritance. We are the priesthood. Verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Until the praise of his glory. Our inheritance. We're to serve God now. Until the until what it says, redemption of the purchased possession. Our inheritance today is twofold. We have an inheritance after the purchase. Redemption of the purchased possession, if I could say it, forgive me, but <laughs> and we have one today. What's our heritage today? To serve God. To be, like I said, to be a verbal witness, to be a living witness, to, to please God and serve Him and live His way and do things His way. Right. Colossians 3.24 Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. What I said, remember, there's two inheritances. There's an inheritance that we're going to get if you suffer with him, you get to rule and reign with him, you get to come back and be priests. That's just not a coincidence. Priests and kings. 
But what's the inheritance today? Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. When you get saved, what's our inheritance today? For ye serve the Lord Christ. What's our inheritance today? The Lord. What's the priesthood today? The body of Christ. What's the temple today? You are the temple for the Holy Ghost. Your body is the temple for the Holy Ghost. So donations in the Old Testament, tithing donation, went to keeping up a building and a Levitical priesthood. So what is that today? It's the body of Christ. So what do donations go to today? The body of Christ. Not a temple built with man's hands and not a, a Levitical priesthood. It goes to the body of Christ as a whole as they have need. And this is what we're going to get into, the tithing today. Okay, I'm sorry I took it the long route, but I wanted to point out that difference. I, could have, I did say it in two seconds, but I wanted to use the scripture to show. The Old Testament, there was a physical temple and a Levitical priesthood. Today, you are the temple, brother says Christ. You are the Levitical priesthood. So what are donations supposed to go to? The poor in Christ. Those, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to get, let's get into it right here. Who says we are to command tithe? Okay, we're not there yet. Who says we are commanded to tithe today? They always say it. They make it like it's a command. You should. That's a command. No, 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 no. We just said should. No, when you tell somebody in any way, shape, or form where you're trying to push it like you have to do it, it's a command. 2 Chronicles 31.4. 2 Chronicles 31.4. Back to the Old Testament. Moreover, he commanded the people that dwelt in Jerusalem to give the portion of the priests and of the Levites that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. And as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of corn, wine, and oil, and honey, and of the increase of the field, and the tithes of all things brought they into abundantly. And concerning the children of Israel and Judah that dwelt in the cities of Judah, they also brought in the tithe of oxen and sheep and the tithe of holy things which were consecrated unto the Lord their God and laid them by heaps. It's a command in the Old Testament. It is there. I'm not denying it. It's there. But is that for today? Oh, well, let's just keep staying in the... They love to just stay in the Old Testament. We're just going to stay in the Old Testament. Uh, now, Hebrews, jump to the New Testament. But Hebrews talks about the Old Testament. Right? So, Hebrews 7, 5. And verily they that are the sons of Levi, who receive the offer, the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of the brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. There you see it again. It's a command. But remember, Hebrews is written to the Jews going into the time of Jacob's trouble. But this is talking about the Old Testament. It's not talking about today. Today, there is no Levitical priesthood. There's no temple. Okay. That's the command. They'll try to grab this. See, it's a command. You're supposed to do it. Give your 10% tithe. We already, did, we already said that 10% had nothing. There is no 10% tithe. That's garbage. It's utter garbage. Okay. And you give out of the abundance. Not 10% of everything you have. You give out of the abundance that God blesses you with. Okay. Malachi 3.8 Malachi chapter 3 verse 8 Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. It's a commandment in the Old Testament and they weren't doing it. They weren't doing it from here, because God also looks at the heart. Remember, there was a time, I don't know if you know the Old Testament, I've been going through the Old Testament a lot lately. There's times where God said, I'm sick of offering offerings, the blood of goats and everything. He's not sick of good offerings, he's sick of those fake offerings where they're just doing it to justify their sin. They're not coming to God broken with a broken and contrite spirit. They, they buy a goat saying, okay, this week I'm going to fornicate. So I bought this goat. So when, after I get done fornicating, I'll take this goat into the temple and have the priest do an animal sacrifice to cover that sin. That's how wicked the Jewish people were getting <coughs> in the Old Testament. Kind of like easy believism today. They plan on sinning and say it's under the blood, it's under the blood. They plan on sinning. Don't get me wrong. If you sin, repent, forsake, get your heart right with the Lord, it's under the blood. Absolutely. But that attitude of, I plan on sinning, 
I'm going to live however I want to live, ungodly, sinful, wicked, evil, lust of the flesh, worldliness. And, and, and Jesus, I'll just go back to the offering that was done at Calvary. Just go back to the offering. And, and, and God was tired of that in the Old Testament, that attitude. He didn't like it in the Old Testament. He doesn't like it today. All right? That's not the attitude a saved sinner is supposed to have. It's supposed to come broken. But I'm getting a little bit off on another subject. But the tithes and offering were a command in the Old Testament. Matthew 22, 17. Someone says, oh, we're going to the New Testament. Uh, this is before Jesus died. This is still Old Testament. Matthew 22, 17. See, these uh, people were trying to trick Jesus. They were trying to get him to go through the Levitical, go against the Levitical laws, the command to tithe. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempest ye me, ye hypocrites? They weren't giving their tithes, they weren't doing the things right, but they were going to try to trip Jesus of. Up, oh, you hypocrites. Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. Remember, they used the word tribute because that's for Greek to English. It's New Testament. Okay. And they still used the word tribute in the Old Testament, but they're using the word tribute. But it's a tie. What they're trying to do is they're trying to trip Jesus up. We're commanded to give tithes and tribute to God. Are you going to forsake that and give it to somebody else? Ooh. That's what they were doing. That's why they called, he called them hypocrites. Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said unto them, Who is the image and superscription? They said unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God. We just read up there. Wouldn't we rob you, God, in Malachi 3.8, in tithes and offerings? People say, well, everything's God. Yeah, everything belongs to God, period. I understand that. But to try to apply this today, if we have to pay taxes, I'll pay taxes. Especially since the money, if you look who's on the money, it's this country, uh, in America, it's, the, it's, it's supposed to be presidents and, and, and important people in our country. It's the country's. It's the country's money. So if they want taxes, uh eh. But we're still supposed to render to God what belongs to God. This temple. This right here belongs to God. Your body is now a living sacrifice. This is what God wants today. Are you giving him that, Lord? Are you giving that to the Lord, brother and Christ? I always ask myself, Lord, is there, is there more I can do? Am I living right? That's the whole point of communion. Am I living right? Am I believing right? Am I standing for what's right? Am I loving my brothers and sisters in Christ? Am I helping them out when you give me the, uh, the ability to help them out and everything? Okay. But not get too straight away. Where is this command, 10%, remember there's no 10% but this tithe, where is this command to tithe? They always have to grab things that have to do with Old Testament. Why don't they grab from the New Testament? Peter Ruckman did, praise God. Yeah, I don't always agree with them, but, you know, the, the elders that rule well, let them be worthy of double honor. Okay, I try my best to honor them. I disagree with them, but I need to do it in a way that I, I still honor them as a brother in Christ, but disagree with them. And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Okay, he left some things out, but he got this right on. Okay, Romans 12, 5. Turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 5. He didn't mention this one. He mentioned 2 Corinthians 9. We're going to get to that one. But God showed me this, Romans 12, 5. This disproves that it's a command that everyone's supposed to give, tithes. This disproves it. Okay. So we, being many, are one body in Christ. Remember, your body's a temple for the Holy Ghost. You're supposed to be a living sacrifice. Now we're all one in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's many bo uh, uh, one body, many members. There's many, there's many offices. But one body. Our one body in Christ and every one members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. i got to point that out again. Having gifts 
differing according to the grace that is given to us. He's going to go into these gifts, and everyone's gift, not everyone has the same gift. God blesses us all in different ways to serve Him in different ways. But we're all one body, and we need to remember that. Oh, no, no, I'm doing this. Everyone needs to be doing what I'm doing. Not necessarily. Sometimes, yeah, we all need to be praying. We all need to be reading the Word of God and studying the Word of God. But God might call you to be an evangelist. He didn't call everyone to be an evangelist. He might have called you to be a Bible teacher, a preacher, a pastor, a bishop, a deacon, an uh, ordained elder. Uh, and there's some other things. Uh, uh, he might call you to be a person that really good at exhorting the brethren and getting them back on the right path. Okay. But this says gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Now it's going to go through these different gifts. Not, not everyone has everything that this, gift, this list is. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. We're not all called to be in the office of a teacher. The elder men are to teach the younger men. The elder women are to teach the younger women the act of teaching. But we're not all called, men are called to be in the office of a teacher, teaching the word of God to the body of Christ as a whole. But not everyone's called to do that. I understand that. Here's eight. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. Not everybody is, is called to really exhort the brethren. I try to encourage it, try to exhort a little bit, but some people are really called to be in an office where they're actually exhorting the brethren. They do it on a, on a weekly basis. I hope I've done it on a weekly basis. Right? Here it is, brothers and He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that giveth, what's it talking about? Tithing. Not tithing like in the Old Testament, but giving. You mean that's something that you're called to do? No, no, it's a command. Everyone's got to do it. No, they don't. No, they don't. Let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with dil diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Now stop here. Number, number, nine. number nine. Let love be without dissimulation. Fake. False. Forced. Forced. Why do we donate today, brother says Christ? I already proved it's to help the body of Christ. We're the temple for the Holy Ghost. We are the Levitical, we're now the priesthood of the believer. We donate to help our brothers and sisters in Christ, loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. When it's forced, is that love real and genuine? Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one towards another with brotherly love. Why do I help brothers and sisters of Christ out? I do it because I love you. I don't do it because I'm forced to do it. But they've been pushing it where it's not. It's, it's like a force to do thing. We're forcing everyone to do it. Everyone's supposed to do it. No, no, no. If God lays it on your heart, He's blessed you in abundance, share. And honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. Patience and tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Here it is, verse 13. Someone says, let's just the act of giving, period. Eh, verse 13. Distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. So up here where it says, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. It's for the distributing to the necessity of the saints. If God calls you, puts it on your heart to give, give. If God has you just barely getting by, you don't have an abundance, but you're staying in the Word of God, you're staying in prayer, fellowship with the brethren, studying the Word of God, living, getting sin out of your life, and living God's way, being separate from the world, and you're living for the Lord, and your temple is holy, and you're still being a verbal witness for Jesus Christ, the ministry of reconciliation, you don't have to give. You're living for the Lord. That's what matters. Pleasing God is what matters. Your life belongs to Him. That's what matters. Not how much money you donate or you can't donate. You're not, they're not, they're not supposed to feel bad because you can't donate and you can't help out. No. But they'll make you feel bad. They'll guilt trip you. Was it guilt tripping, bullying, and bribing? Those are three hardcore tactics they use 
to get to force people to donate. Be careful of those tactics. Okay? It's, it's a gift differing according to the grace that God has given to us. God has gifted some brethren with abundance that they can share with brethren that are lacking. The brethren that are lacking, if they're not given to anybody, don't feel bad. Don't feel like you're less of a, I'm a less of a Christian than that person over there that has abundance. No, you're not. Okay? We are all called into the ministry of reconciliation. We are all one in Christ Jesus. We're one body with many members. We're all working together. Okay? My biggest thing is, is, are you praying every day? Start your day with the Word of God. I always push that. Starting your day with the Word of God and prayer. Are you ending the day with the Word of God and prayer? Are you talking to God throughout the day? Are you asking Him and seeking His will, seeking His wisdom? Are you there for the brethren to fellowship? When a brother in Christ needs help, are you there for him? Do you put the brethren, put the Word of God first and foremost, your work, walk with the Lord second, the brethren third. Do you put the brethren before worldly things? Like holidays, Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, anime, secular style music. You see what we talk about? I've lost fellowship with brethren over these things because they put the world first. They didn't put God first.